Hey folks, Alamanic the Hot Rod Hip here. This video is C10 build vlog number 11, I believe. This one is gonna be an update video. Basically here, I'm just gonna go ahead and show you stuff that I've been working on on the C10 lately that hasn't made it into dedicated videos at this point. Due to my current technological issues that I can't really edit the big videos at this moment and the fact that I'm way behind where I wanted to be on the project at this point, this is what you're gonna get for this moment. So stick around, check out the little stuff that has not got into the videos to this point. Let me, let's get a better perspective on this. We get the air tanks back here. We get these two cylindrical tanks. These are two and a half gallon tanks for a total of five gallon capacity for the air ride suspension on this truck. You might notice here how close these are to the tires. And that's just a fact of life in this truck, you know, trying to find the lack of space and work with it. The area over top of the fuel tank, my dad wants for a storage area. So we're not gonna have that to put tanks in. I took an inch out of each of these mounting brackets and brought them tighter to the frame rails. Before that, they were too close for comfort, in my opinion. Even though with the Wattslink design rear suspension, this thing shouldn't walk side to side at all, so it really shouldn't have been an issue, but just uh, the stone kicked up, it got stuck between the tire and the tank, something like that, I was a little bit worried about. I did discuss the Wattslink in a previous video a couple of years ago when I built it, but let me just go ahead and show you it in operation. I also went ahead and got the KYB rear shocks installed in here. They mount to the proper Porterbilt suspension upper mount, but I made some custom mounts on the lower trailing arms to attach them. I'm going for the maximum length of shock that I could fit in here so I don't have a shock limiting factor on compression or extension. Along with that, we also have these. These are limiting straps that I had running down to the axle. The reason for the limiting straps is pretty simple. We are running Firestone F9000 sleeve bags back here because that's what the Porterbilt suspension calls for. As such, these things, they have decent travel, excellent ride quality, but they're not strong. You cannot hang a rear axle off of these things. It would be, it would rip either the bag, it would rip the cup off the end of the bag. You do not want to do that. You either, you either need your shock or a limiting strap to keep the axle from falling down out of the vehicle. Though you might notice that these limiting straps, they're mounted here, they run up and over, and then they go down to the axle tube down there. Why the heck did I do that? The reason for that is the length limiting strap that I needed was about an 11 inch limiting strap to go straight from there down to the axle. I couldn't find them anywhere thanks to uh, the human malware issue we have right now. There's just no supply out there. So this, this was the length I was able to get, but I just flipped it up and over this tube and it, it worked. Next up, you've probably seen this little tray in the shots already here. This is a tray that mounts over top of the axle shaft for the airlift performance valve that's gonna be installed on here. This valve body is the control system and also valves that control the air ride suspension on this truck. It'll actually send the bags their air pressure to get this thing up to height. There will be height sensors on this to get it exactly where it's supposed to be every time. We will definitely do a dedicated video about either this or the plumbing for it. So look out for that soon. Moving on to a handful of things that my dad built. He built this cross member here. This is kind of floating out here in the middle of nowhere, but the reason for that is the bed mounts to this. Because of the raised bed floor over the step notch of this thing, this thing will hold the front of the bed up at the height that we need it at. Then you notice these two things hanging off of here. Clearly, they're mufflers. Why are they there? I don't know that I ever got around to putting it in a vlog, but my dad wanted fender exit exhaust. He wanted it coming out in front of the rear tires through the bedside. I actually made custom exhaust flanges that go around them and I cut through the bedside. The bed's already off at bodywork getting paint and body done, so I don't have it here to show you unfortunately, but here's a photo of what those flanges looked like. They're they custom made aluminum flanges with countersunk hardware in there and we're gonna probably either polish them or brush them and clear coat them later on down the road, we'll decide that. So the, rather than trying to fit mufflers underneath the floorboards in this thing and having the heat of that and all, I use this dead space over top of the drive shaft and below the bed floor to mount these mufflers. And the idea is pretty darn straightforward here. The exhaust will come up for the passenger side, will come up along the frame rail, it will shoot upward here, and then it will go into that muffler there. Then it'll cross through 
head out over there and down to the bedside exit over there. Driver's side, same things, but in reverse. Up to here, out here, and then over this way. Pretty straightforward. Next up, my dad made this battery tray bracket here. He used the original battery tray, well, a new Repop one, but then made brackets to mount it off the side of the frame rail here. It's up above the frame bottom, so even if this thing lays on the ground, the battery's safe. But the idea here was to get it out from under the hood so we had a cleaner underhood look and still have it somewhere that I can get to it and wire everything. The only annoying thing is that when you want to change the battery, you probably have to jack it up or put it on a lift and get it from underneath to get to it because the bed floor will be over top of this and we're not putting an access door in there. We are probably going to put remote jumper points at the back of the truck. So if the battery ever dies, you can still jump it or charge it without having to jack the whole truck up and get to it. Over on this side, same space, we've got the air compressor for the air ride suspension. I had my dad whip up these brackets here to mount it to the frame in the same location as the battery. And I had him make it double sized so that we could run two compressors side by side here. We only have one at the moment and I'm only really intending to install the one, but I'm just future proofing. If my dad decides he's not happy that it takes too long to fill up, we can always just put a second compressor in there. I'm probably even gonna wire in the relay and just like tie up the wires inside. So it'll be ready to go for the eventuality of if or when he wants it. Now the doors are off of the truck. Quite clearly, I did door gaps on this thing. One of the doors is over there, the other one is over there on a stand. Doing door gaps on this thing, I had really intended to do a dedicated video about that. I even posted photos of the door gaps that I got on this thing on Instagram, and people are asking, oh, can you do a video about how you do door gaps? And I really, really wanna do that for you folks, but I'm already here weeks past when I wanted to be, or expected to be. This project has taken a lot more time than I expected, which, is just reality of building a custom vehicle, unfortunately. So I just, I couldn't dedicate the amount of time that I would want to, to do a good quality video for you folks about how I do door gaps. Okay, moving into the truck itself. I shaved the original speaker off of here. I feel like I might've mentioned this in a previous one. I also shaved the radio opening because somebody butchered it on this truck previously. So it had to go away. I just shaved it smooth. And now we're gonna do this full custom layout that I laid out here. This black box closest to the driver here, this is gonna be where the controller for the air ride suspension is for controlling the height and monitoring the pressures and everything. I want it to be easily accessible for whenever my dad wants to make changes, going into a car show, going into a parking lot that needs a little height to add, whatever he wants to do. Up here, we've got the AC controls, the knobs to control the temperature and the fan and all that are gonna be at the top up here, nice and easily accessible, central in the vehicle. There's something here to talk about. These two pieces, I intend to pick up a 3D printer and learn 3D design so that I can make some custom stuff for this. I wanna make a bezel that goes around the air ride controller so it's not just mounted flat on here. I wanna actually recess it into the dashboard. And then I also wanna make a bezel to go behind those knobs so they're not, not just knobs mounted to the dashboard. Lastly, this box is the double din radio and where that is gonna go. It's my intention to put a double din radio in there because I feel like it'd be a waste of space to put a regular single size one in there. I hate, hate, hate those classic radios, the ones that are made to look like the old knob style radios, but have modern internals. They never work. They are garbage. I've installed them in numerous vehicles over the years and every, every, every one of them I've ever installed has had problems. The reason for a double din radio is that at the end of the day, I just wanna be a black box in there. So many single din radios are these hideous alien spaceship freaking things. I wish manufacturers would make a just a simple radio. Big buttons that can be easily seen without having to put on reading glasses. You can easily press one without pressing multiple buttons at the same time. They overcomplicate this so much and I don't understand it. Somebody needs to make like a factory-ish looking radio where it's just got nice big buttons that are easy to deal with. And that's where the touch screen double din radios come in. They are, in my opinion, easier to operate and see what you're doing than a lot of these aftermarket ones are. I got the turn signals mounted into the GMC hood here. They have this nice design that the Chevys just don't have. I love this about the GMCs. Originally, they had clips that held them in and all it did was clip into the hood, but that meant when it got removed from the hood, it like pulled dimples into the metal all the way around. It was a total mess and it was not good for something you're gonna 
put in and take out a couple of times for the paint and body work, it was just no good. So what I did instead is I put some nut certs into the hood and into the light itself and I made these quick little triangle brackets that bolt to the hood and then bolt to the light. So the light comes in from in front but is held in position where it needs to be nice and solid and it's easily removable and reinstallable without having to damage anything to do so. Now I also mounted a couple of tanks on here. This one here is the overflow bottle for the radiator. This is from All Star Performance. The tank itself is from them and that's how it came, but I added this mounting bracket on it that mounts to the core support here and I added this lid. It didn't have a lid. It was just meant for like a race car overflow. I didn't like that. It's meant to be a recovery tank. So, you know, the fluid will overflow from the radiator into there, get caught, but then the radiator can suck it back in if it needs to. And then it has this overflow at this higher level. That'll be the emergency overflow. I'll, I'll put some custom hardline tubing on that down to the ground so that it can overflow from there. On the other side, we have another tank also from All Star Performance, and this one is the power steering reservoir. On this truck, we are running a, a GM Type 2 with an external reservoir, no reservoir mounted to it, power steering pump. This is the tank that I put on there for the power steering. It's got a dash six return line that'll come from the rack to return back to here. And on the bottom of it is a dash 10 line that will go to feed the pump. And it just kind of mirrors the overflow tank on the other side. You got the one tank there and the one tank here flanking the radiator. As I've been getting ready to plumb this thing, and I'm definitely absolutely doing dedicated videos about how I plumb the fuel system, probably the air ride system as well on this truck. I'm working with the folks at Red Horse Performance to do full AN plumbing for this thing. And I want to show you folks how I do that. I've done dedicated videos explaining AN fittings before but I wanna show you in operation a full project how I do it on a truck. All right, folks, that's gonna wrap it up for this one, this update video. That's just some, I'm sure I forgot a ton of little things. We've been working here, there, everywhere on this truck, bouncing around, getting things ready. You know, I got the whiteboard here that I showed you folks in earlier videos. I've updated it a couple of times. I've crossed things off. I've completely rewritten it as we've moved on. There's a lot left to do on this truck. All right, folks, that's gonna wrap it up for this one. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please go ahead and drop it a like it really helps out let me know in the comments what do you think about the updates that i've done since the last time you've seen the truck the exhaust the radio what do you think i should do for that let me know in the comments down below check out the patreon account patreon.com slash hot rod hippie that directly supports this channel and get subscribed to keep up to date with all the hot rod hippie content thanks for coming around folks